Welcome in to Payoff Pitch, Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast presented by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. Brendan Glasheen, your host, joined today by Sean Zarillo and Jim Turvey. We're talking Monday Best Bets. It's the start of April. April 1, you can hear Best Bets every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday mornings during the regular season. So subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And find us also on Action Network's YouTube page. We also greatly appreciate five-star ratings and reviews. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Whatever you have to say, uh, we appreciate the feedback. 14-game slate, a couple of day games today. We've got the Braves and the White Sox at 210. The Rockies, quick turnaround. They were uh, in Arizona yesterday. They're playing the Cubs at Wrigley at 220 Eastern. A couple of 4 o'clock. There's one 4 o'clock in there, Pittsburgh and the Nationals and... Kansas City and Baltimore at 635. And then this this schedule, just quick quick aside, this is like, this is an opening day schedule to me. You, know, you got the staggered times. This is what I was looking for. <laughs> or I think most people were looking for last Thursday. But uh, that's the point. Here we are. Um, let's dive in. We'll do best bets. We'll look at the uh, what the public sides are for today. If the guys are going to fade the public. Underdogs the guys might like. And then some final bets. And we'll get out of here. Uh, Sean Zarilla with this big slate, some games scattered all over the cal- all over the uh, time frames today. What jumps out to you as a best bet? Philadelphia Phillies minus 150 first five and full game would bet those up to about minus 165 and minus 160 respectively. I think there's a chance this line is being held down because the market isn't sure if Bryce Harper will be in the lineup. Rob Thompson said he was scheduled for an off day yesterday. It had nothing to do with him falling into the dugout. On Saturday, I don't know if I 100% believe that, but I do believe he will be in the lineup today. And I would imagine the line ticks up for Philly once he is confirmed in. Prefer Christopher Sanchez to Andrew Rabbit. About six points better in terms of stuff plus last season. Three and a half percent better in his strikeout minus walk rate. And in terms of 2024 projections, his average FIP is about a quarter of a run lower. Phillies also have the better bullpen by about half run per game. The better offense by about a half run per game. And the better defense also by about a half run per game when I actually project it out. So advantages everywhere for Philadelphia in this matchup. Also like the class relief that they're getting going from the Braves to the Reds in terms of the decline in pitching quality, the decline in offensive quality, and also the class increase for the Reds going from playing the Nationals, who I like to win the fewest games of baseball this season, now taking on a Phillies team that has been to the NLCS in back-to-back years. So big difference in opponents to start this season, big difference in their opponents this weekend. Like the Phillies, as I said, to minus 165 for the first five innings, minus 160 for the full game. Jim Turvey, welcome back. You were here at the end of last week. What do you got for a best bet uh, coming up for today, Monday? It's a little bit ugly. I'm going with the Pittsburgh Pirates on the road, plus 100. Uh, I say ugly not because of the Pirates. Uh, in fact, the Pirates Nationals uh, are, you know, that I, I like to be on the Pirate side of this, but the pitching matchup is a little bit ugly. Um, I'm going with Marco Gonzalez against Mackenzie Gore. In terms of a stuff-off, uh, Marco Gonzalez is never going to win a stuff-off with Mackenzie Gore. However, in terms of results, uh, the two haven't been all that far separate from each other. And I think this Pittsburgh team is far better than the Nationals team. Um, I really like what I've seen from Pittsburgh early in the season. You don't want to overreact to, you know, a a small sample here, but they've been absolutely demolishing lefties um, in, you know, even smaller of a sample. But I do think that they, I I really like that they have been platooning a lot better and getting matchups and really they have the depth um, that their lineup hasn't had in years past and the ability to kind of match up seek. I think that in a match in a in a game here with Washington, who really does not have the depth of talent that, that Pittsburgh does, even though Pittsburgh's only maybe a tier above Washington when it terms to comes to full season, I think it's a pretty notable tier. Uh, I'm with Sean in looking at the Nationals potentially for fewest wins in baseball. I think they are one of the worst teams in baseball. I think they'll only get worse as the season goes along. But for today, uh, I'm looking to fade them uh, at home against Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has. You know, they they've, they got off to a hard start, hot start last season as well, faded down the stretch. I think this team is a little bit better. Um, I don't think – I'm not quite on on board with, you know, some of the, the higher range. I know, you know, Sarah, on, on one of his hot takes was throwing out division. I'm not quite there. We also got a good start from the Brewers as well, so that's that's good for us that we're on the Brewers. But um, from this, this single-game matchup today, I like Pittsburgh. Uh, even in what's kind of an ugly pitching matchup, certainly if you're to go by, by stuff in – just kind of the the flashier the names, uh, Marco Gonzalez isn't going to get you there. But I also like the Pittsburgh bullpen compared to Washington as well. So you get a little bit of advantage. So definitely go full game there. Um, and that's at plus 100. Yeah, and the fun thing about the Pirates getting off to a hot start this year is the hotter they are, the quicker Paul Skeens and Quinn Brewster yeah. come up. Like 
it's going to force their hand quicker. So Jared Jones looked, looked great the awesome. other day. You throw Keller, Jones, yeah. Priester, and Skeens together. I don't want to rule out this team for winning division. They're exciting. O'Neill Cruz looks great. So yeah, the, the Pirates are finally hitting their competitive phase. I'm really excited for them, excited for their fans. Probably some of the best colors and unis in baseball, yeah. one of the best stadiums in baseball. So I'm, I'm very excited for the people in Pittsburgh. And I think we see Skeens and Priester within the next six weeks or so. Fascinating fade the public segment for today. It's the first game on the slate at 210. The Braves send Charlie Morton to the mound. They're in Chicago to take on the White Sox. Chris Flexen is the starting pitcher. Looking at the action app as we speak, just after 10 Eastern on this Monday morning, 93% of the bets are on the Braves, but 88% of the cash is on the White Sox. They're north of uh, plus 200 on the money line. Total uh, in this one is sitting at, let's see, totals at eight and a half, nine, uh, but the money's coming in on the over. So we're going to focus this segment on the total, uh, 88, uh, 89% of the bets, 88% of the cash on over nine with this pitching matchup, Zarello, any edges? Does, is the public on to something, or do you want to come back the other side on the under, possibly? No, I'm on the over. I bet the over last night. It has ticked up a little bit, but I still like it where it is currently. I bet the over five in the first five innings to minus 105. I bet an over nine for the game to minus 110. I also like the Braves in the first five innings at minus 200 or better. There was a minus 190 out there. The rest of the market was kind of at minus 220, so we'll just take anything below minus 200. But like the overs in this matchup, and I don't think we'll see a bigger difference between bullpen and starting lineup this season. I talked about the White Sox. Bullpen before opening day does not project to have any reliever below a 4.3 fit projected for this season. So I have several teams. I mean, the Braves, for example, I have one, two, three, four, five, six relievers projected for a sub four fit. Most of them projected for a sub five. The White Sox don't have a single reliever of their bullpen. I project below 4.3. So a full run difference between these two bullpens. The Braves also project for about a 125 WRC plus for me, which is 25% better than league average. I mean, it's really difficult for me to get an offense that high. The Dodgers and the Braves have really separated themselves in terms of their offensive talent relative to everybody else. So I think I see a lot of late, late runs coming for Atlanta. I don't mind their team total over, but I see early runs in this matchup too. Charlie Morton really overachieved last season. His expected ERA was a full run higher than his actual ERA. He's 40 years old, probably not going to improve. And Chris Flexen was one of the worst starters in baseball last season. There were 127 pitchers who threw at least 100 innings. Flexen was second to last with a 6.2 expected ERA. He was 115th in expected FIP, 122nd in strikeout minus walk rate. So ranked among the bottom of starters across all three key performance indicators. I projected this total closer to nine and a half runs, closer to 5.4 over the first five innings. So uh, first five over five to minus 105, full game over nine to minus 110 in Chicago. Not the best over weather, but probably get a lot of walks and just disastrous results from that Chicago bullpen at some point. Hasn't really happened yet, but it's coming. Jim Turvey, any uh, edges here on the total in this one? The public likes the over in Braves, White Sox. Yeah, so I'm pretty aligned with Sean, especially on the first five. I think these are two starters that are begging for regression. Um, The White Sox lineup isn't the best, but the Braves can almost get this like on their own, basically. Uh, I really do like maybe hyper-focusing on the Braves. If you're going to go full game, I don't hate going uh, on the Braves team total specifically. Um, the White Sox used Michael Kopech yesterday. He's probably their best reliever. Jordan Leisure, they used two days ago. he did throw 22 pitches, though. And the other thing that I think is, is you know, potentially leaning towards uh, riding with the over is I, I don't see this being a particularly close game. Uh, I don't know if both teams will use their A bullpen or if they'll just kind of save some bullets for a potentially closer game down the line. One thing I did want to ask Sean, though, I was, I was interested by the fact that this game, the Braves took um, most of the bets, the White Sox took most of the money, but the line moved a lot towards the Braves. Uh, usually, I feel like the, the book's, move by you know sharper money maybe bigger bets more than you know the public in general i'm curious uh i don't maybe maybe we didn't dive into this and i'm now jumping it on people but i'm curious about that breakdown of the the white Sox taking a bigger chunk of money but the line moving towards atlanta i'm definitely with you on atlanta um but that that just struck me as a, a little odd it's uh it's not uncommon for the best teams in baseball to constantly steam upwards. Um, you know, they, they may be seeing a, and this is just me kind of guessing to a degree, but monitoring the market every day. And this is not the guessing part, monitoring the market every day. When I'm betting against the best teams like the Dodgers or the Braves, you are kind of better off waiting out, not betting it overnight because there's almost never overnight movement towards the underdog. It's very rare. 
And even the other night when I fired bets on the Cardinals, wake up, the Cardinals are 20 cents higher than what you fired overnight. It's like, why Why did I bet that? <laughs> I, I know full well the Dodgers are going to take – or the Dodgers line is going to steam up. So, uh, you know, our betting percentages don't have volume. I mean, we, we see how many bets. So we do have volume to degree. And because it's the first game of the day, there we have the most number of bets. But also, books are setting lines in anticipation of money that's still to come. And they may know that – they have guys who are always going to smash the Braves right before close once they get lineups confirmed or what have you. So maybe they just have indicators, hey, they're not going to sit, you know, they're starting catcher today or or what have you. And they're kind of ticking the line up in anticipation of once lineups confirm, that is where money is going to come in. So yeah, I, I would imagine books don't only adjust based off of the money they've received, but also based off of customers they typically have. And timing that they expect to get bets you're, you're just setting a line based on anticipation of future bets so i definitely think that could that could definitely be a uh a reason why the money would be against bets would be on it money would be against it it would seem like a public favorite but at the same time they may just be anticipating big that bets cat and mouse game line. they play every day yeah yeah chris flexen starting he was with the rockies last year oh my goodness uh 42 earned runs in 60 and a third innings last year <laughs> And this guy still cracked the rotation. Um, I mean, we'll see. I, I saw he was 14 and six with the Seattle Mariners going back to 2021, yep. but last year was putrid. Well, and even goodness. that 14 and six uh, year was was begging for regression, if I remember correctly. Yeah, home run problem, walks. I mean, the, the walks aren't horrible compared to some others, but it's not great. Um, but yeah, right. they, I mean, the White Sox have been playing in kind of bad weather the tigers don't really hit all that much like i think this bullpen is due to just implode at some point like jim said i think the braves can actually get there on their own so <laughs> the over five and a half on the team total not bad that's roughly where yeah. i project it i think as as jim also pointed out right if they have a big lead if they're up six one seven one they probably don't go to aj mint they probably don't go to iglesias they probably throw their third or fourth tier relievers which are still very good relievers because everybody on their team is good but not the most effective guys all right so there you go. That's the uh, fade the public segment. We did it over today. Just want to be clear. We're talking about the bets on the oh. total, not the money line side uh, with Braves, because that seems pretty obvious based on what we just discussed using the Dodgers and the Cardinals as an example. Uh, underdog for the day, uh, for today, the Dodgers are still playing. The Dodgers, this schedule early on has been brutal when you consider Korea. And then here they are playing again today. They're hosting the Giants tonight. Zarillo, you see an edge on the Giants. I do. This was my biggest projected edge last night. I projected the Giants closer to plus 150, 40% roughly. And you were getting as high as plus 190. You can still find that plus 190 out there. I like that down to about plus 165 for the full game, plus 170 for the first five innings. Not really sure what we're going to get for James Paxton, but he's nowhere near his peak. And he threw last year as hard as he had in about five years, but he really faded down the stretch. 95.7 miles an hour over his first 10 starts, 22%, 22 strike at minus walk rate. Final eight starts, fastball velocity dipped by a mile an hour. Strike up minus walk rate half to 11%. And he went on the aisle in September with a knee injury. And the spring didn't look all that great. You know, a couple walks, a couple strikeouts in his last start, three at eight pitches. So getting his arm ramped up. But in terms of 2024 projections, Paxton is anywhere between a 4.3 and a 4.6 on a FIP projection. Keaton Wynn between 4.05 and 4.25. So about a quarter of a run, a third of a run better for Keaton Wynn. I think this kid is a really underrated pitcher. He made some very solid starts for the Giants towards the end of last season. He has a beautiful splitter, 143 stuff plus on his slitter. He has a fastball and a slider, both of which exceed 100 on stuff plus. So the pitch mix is in there. Fastball, splitter, slider. We'll see if he throws the slider more this season. But, you know, all the talk about Kyler Harris in this offseason, obviously Logan Webb, Blake Snell signing. The Giants have a lot of pieces in their rotation to be competitive. I didn't hear a peep about Keaton Witt. So this kid is super underrated just because nobody talks about him. I think he's undervalued because nobody talks about him. But you look at the projections, and this kid is like a pretty solid number three starter based on the expectations. So Giants plus 190 right now I think is a great price down to plus 166. And then plus 170, I'd take a small poke for the first five innings as well, not expecting Paxton to be fully ramped up and not really sure if he's going to get back to where he was in the first half of last season. What do you think of the Dodgers' defense so far? 
Mookie's look great at shortstop. And I think that's the most impressive aspect is if you're going to put a bat of that quality at shortstop, it's almost an impossible team to beat. Because if you have up the middle, you know, I'm, I'm a big building up the middle guy, catcher, middle and field, center field. If you get offensive contributions from those positions, it's such a big advantage because replacing corner outfield, replacing corner infield offense is easier to replicate than it is getting offensive contributions up the middle. So the Dodgers are super dangerous if Mookie is going to play defense like this. But yeah, I, uh, I've been very impressed. I've been very impressed with Mason Wynn shortstops defense for the Cardinals. Same series, but Mason Wynn is a gold glover to me. So definitely some, uh, some interesting pieces, uh, you know, in new positions out there in the league right now. But yeah, the, the Dodgers don't really strike me as like, like Outman. They should have a, a solid defensive outfield. The infield was the questions. Muncie's a bit of a hole. Gavin Lux at shortstop was going to be a hole, but Mookie solved that. So they should be fine. Freddie Freeman was surprisingly awful as a defender last season. That's not what you'd expect from him, given his athleticism and stuff like that. So definitely keep an eye on Freddie's metrics this season. But their their outfield should be a average defensive outfield. And if Mookie's going to be above average shortstop, they're fine. Watching him out there th- over the weekend, I'm like, wow, it's it's seamless. Or I, I forget he played right field uh, for the majority. Yeah, of he's the leading all shortstops in defensive run save. Granted, through only four games, but it, sure. it speaks to the quality of the plays he's making. What what really impresses me is his bounce throws. He know like it's almost like he knows he doesn't have like the normal shortstop arm. So when he has to make a longer throw, he'll just place this beautiful bounce throw that just hits once and like a lacrosse ball just pops right into Freeman's glove. It's like he he has the bounce throw down. It's very impressive. Something to keep an eye on if they keep it going. Uh, Jim Turvey, underdog. You're, you're liking the Giants, I am too. liking the Giants. Well, one one point on that Mookie thing. Uh, Sean and I were talking before sure. the season. I think, yeah, and, and it, it already moved a little bit, in part because he's started the season absolutely scorching hot. But Mookie being at shortstop is massive for, you know, MVP award has become kind of a sort the rankings by war. There's, you know, you got to be in at least the top three. And him at shortstop, if he's leading league in defensive run saves as a shortstop and hitting like this it's gonna be pretty hard to find an mvp that isn't mookie he is the leader it, right now by odds um you could have gotten like plus 750 before the season which was really nice but you know i keep an eye on that see if the the you know defensive metrics take a while to stabilize anyways um but just keep an eye on that situation he's one that and he's, he's got a proven track record in terms of production and he's a pretty healthy guy mostly so we, we know the Dodgers are going to be there. I think, you know, it's it's kind of a boring MVP pick. He's the shortest odds. But I do think, you know, potentially it could be one of those where you need to grab the value, even if, at, you know, at a plus 400, plus 500, because he's just going to start running away with it. Um, so so something to keep an eye on there with if he stays at shortstop or if you start to hear them in rumors to pick up someone like a Willie Adamas, then it's like, oh, well, maybe, you know, he isn't going to collect as much at war at shortstop. And that's that's something to keep an eye on as well. So just talking through that real briefly. Uh, I am riding with Sean on the Giants. Uh, I've really liked the Giants are another team. I've really liked what I've seen from them out of the, the early season. I think they had a couple of more, you know, under the radar moves and just kind of trusting a, a couple of players that they have had, you know, either in the system or just on the team in general in the last couple of years. I've been impressed with their start to the season. Um, Sean, Sean covered most of that pretty well, so I don't need to go too in depth. There's a couple other names though. I mean, my best bet was technically plus 100. Uh, I don't know if we can get away with calling that uh, an underdog, but there's a few other names that, that caught my eye. The Royals actually on the road opened at plus 140, and I didn't hate that number against Dean Kramer, um, who's a pitcher that I've just never been really that high on. Um, it moved into a zone that I don't love quite as much. There wasn't a, a ton of wiggle room there. Um, and the last one, these are all more leans and absolute loves uh, for me. But um, Arizona hosting the Yankees today. Ryan Nelson is a pitcher who I I uh, am am higher on um, than I think the market a little bit. Uh, and I, I think there's some some intrigue there for for the Diamondbacks. But I think my favorite is uh, again the Giants at plus one ninety as well. The Mookie Betts MVP number at BetMGM has come down to plus five hundred. Second favorite in the National League behind. Acuna. Oh, he still is behind Acuna. Yeah, you. The, the power is insane. I mean, he increased the power last year. It was evident. He went to driveline and that, that was something he worked on, but it looks like it's sticking around. I thought he was actually a solid bet for home run leader last year, at like a hundred, 150 to one, just because the power metrics had bumped up. So yeah, Mookie continues to get better as a player. It's unbelievably impressive. I don't know if there's anything this guy can't do. Like if you, is there a sport that Mookie bets wouldn't be able to play professionally if he had dedicated his whole life to it. Football, maybe because of the size, but like he'd probably be a slot receiver or something. So yeah, Mookie, Mookie bets is one of the best athletes on the planet. And I'm glad he's finally getting the recognition for it. 
He's an avid bowler too. Yeah, he's Multiple bowled 300 games. Yeah, he's yeah. unbelievable <laughs> as an athlete. Unbelievable. I'm sure he could play basketball. He probably would have been a great striker in soccer or something if he had dedicated his whole life to it. So he's a phenomenal athlete. And I know baseball players get ragged on a lot for their physique and whatnot, but there's there's nothing athletically. I don't think Mookie Betts would be good. But Verdugo is like basically as good, right, Brendan? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's <laughs> that's good. Uh, <laughs> Final bet. Arizona's playing playing Verdugo's yeah. new team, the Yankees and in, in Gorilla. You want to echo Jim on the uh the Diamondbacks today? Yeah, I do. Arizona are down to plus one oh three is a bet for me. Uh Luis Hill for Gil Hill, I'm not sure the correct pronunciation, but in spring he popped the one twenty stuff plus for the Yankees. So I think this could actually be a sneaky under here in Arizona between the Yankees and the Diamondbacks. Arizona's advantage for me is defensive base running. Fourth versus tenth in defensive run saved last year, sixth versus twenty eighth in base running value. So they're probably going to put a lot of pressure on the Yankees pitching staff to defend the steals, put a pressure on their outfield to defend taking extra bases. I know Juan Soto threw out that guy the other night. He's not the best defensive outfielder. And I don't really think the Yankees defensive quality is anything to do with their quality as a team. They're a power hitting team who needs to outscore you generally, or they have a pretty good bullpen too. But I think Gil could give them some pretty solid innings as a starter. And he might be a guy we bet on going forward. But in terms of tonight's matchup, I do like Arizona at plus one eight home, down to plus one oh three. Uh I'm against Jim in that Orioles Royals matchup, but just a small bet, minus one forty, minus one fifty, first five and full game on Baltimore. I bet against Dean Kramer a bunch last season, so I was kind of surprised to see Baltimore pop up as an edge in my model today. Just a small edge though. Uh the Mets, the other favorite that I like on the board. They're getting a lot of class relief too, like the Braves. Mets were playing the Brewers, facing that pitching staff that throws 100 miles an hour. You know, every guy that comes out of the bullpen, an impossible bullpen to handle. Now they're facing the Tigers. The bullpen is much worse. The starting pitching quality should be about the same. The pitching is very comparable on both sides of this matchup. In particular for Monday, though, I like the Mets much offense. The Mets offense much better against the righty than I do the Tigers against the lefty. Really, Torkelson is the one batter I'm particularly scared of against the left-handed starter. They also throw in Matt Veerling as a platoon bat. They have some guys they can platoon, but most of their best hitters are left-handed. Riley Green, Kerry Carpenter, even their two rookies, Cole Keith, Parker Meadows, those guys are all left-handed. So I think getting a lefty against uh, with Sean Manaya against the Tigers today. And Manaya actually projects slightly better than what Reese Olsen does. I might prefer Olsen. I mean, I have Olsen on fantasy teams. I, I like Olsen better in terms of like pitchers I would select going forward. But Shamanai does have the better projections and he looked pretty solid in spring. So going to take the Mets of both halves there up to I think minus 150-ish. Uh, let me check on a price target. I will vamp though in the meantime and talk about the Marlins over, which is uh, a solid bet for me for the next two days. The Mets up to minus 133 in either half is the price target. So finally, the Marlins Angels over. The Marlins went to extra innings twice in four days with the Pirates. Their bullpen really got overextended. And in particular, their key reliever, Sixto Sanchez, Andrew Nardi, Anthony Bender, George Soriano. Those are their four best relievers. They worked two out of the first three days. They sat yesterday. They're all available today. But if any of them work today, they're sitting tomorrow. So I like the over today. If those guys pitch today, I like the over tomorrow. Because the Marlins are running out of bullpen. They threw their two wrong relievers on Saturday. Those guys combined for over 90 pitches. They just don't really have a bridge today. Max Meyer maxed out at 40 pitches in spring training. He's coming back from Tommy's around surgery. They're not going to push him. So I just don't see how the Marlins get the innings until Thursday. They need that off day on Thursday. They need a starter to give them innings. And they're not really going to get it over the next three days, or at least the next few days. So the Marlins, Angels over eight and a half, projected this total closer to nine. Don't like both bullpens in general, but really think the Marlins are going to have an issue just getting the innings. So over today, but also keep an eye on that over for tomorrow. Like I said, Nardi, Sanchez, Bender, Soriano, if any of those guys go today, they're out tomorrow. Okay. And then one more for uh, Jim. You're talking, well, one more game, but you're targeting two picks in the, in Zarello's best bet. He had the Phillies. You're looking at Phillies. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted to talk through that, why I'm targeting Phillies first five and why I'm targeting the full game over. And it kind of overlaps with what Sean was just talking about bullpen usage. So the Phillies bullpen really got worked by, you know, having to deal with Atlanta to open the, the season. So they have uh, Dominguez has pitched the last two days. Alvarado pitched Friday and Sunday. So he's pitched two out of three. And one of those days was a 30 pitch outing. Uh, Connor Brogdon, two out of three. Uh, Marte, two out of three. Strom, two out of three. Hoffman, two out of three. Soto, two out of three. So they've really, that bullpen has really been used hard. 
However, I still really like Christopher Sanchez. I'm, I, I want to fade Andrew Abbott. So I love taking the Phillies on the first five. But I'm going to look at, because I like the, the Phillies hitting matchup against Abbott in the first five, and I like the potential for the Reds to maybe get some runs off of the Phillies bullpen at the end. I do like the over in that game uh, to eight and a half right now. It actually opened at nine. So it's the potential that I'm off of the market here and folks should maybe wait and you could maybe even get a little bit better number. But I like that over eight and a half. Uh, I'd even potentially look at over nine if you could get like a minus 105 or something like that. So um, that's kind of the logic on on why I'm targeting Phillies for the first five specifically, but then the full game over because I do think there's the potential for the Phillies, Phillies bullpen to be a little bit worn down after having to deal with uh, Atlanta to start the the season. So I should comment just because I, I did bet the under nine last night before it moved. I project there's wind in. There's been bad weather in Philly the past few days. Obviously, that didn't affect the games between the Braves and the Phillies because both offenses are so good. Yeah, I probably want to either bet eight pregame and have, you know, that middle on eight, nine or um, just take a live like over a six live and a half, be a great something look, yeah. like that over four and a half as the game is going. Yeah, I, I don't love. The bullpens for the the bullpen situation for other teams, but also just all the late scoring we've seen from these bullpens across baseball. Uh, you know, Anthony DeBundo was messaging me the other day, and he's like, "What's what's going on with the bullpens?" Because he pointed out that the the strikeout minus walk rate is the lowest it's been for bullpens in the past ten years. Granted, very small sample, right? But there's so many late run scoring going on in these games, and I don't know if it's the relievers not having a sufficient sample with the 18 second pitch clock. And then they're coming in games with runners on base and they're freaking out a little bit because they don't have as much time to throw, but strikeout rate is down for relief pitchers this season. It's at 22.7%. You know, it's been around 24% the past couple of years as strikeouts have been continuing to increase around baseball and their walk rate is 10.4%, which is the highest it's been in 10 years. I mean, uh, it typically averages closer to 9.2%. So 1.2% above that. Bullpens are just struggling so far, and I'm not really sure why, but it seems like every time I have an under, it's blowing up in the seven through nine innings, and it's been very frustrating, <laughs> but I've actually bet many more overs so far than I have in recent years, and, uh, you know, I think people want to say, like, the ball's juiced. I, I said maybe the ball's juiced, you know. Uh, if you look on Baseball Savant, they have their drag, uh, historical drag values, and you can look at the chart. It's very much in line with last season. Like, there's nothing that suggests – that the ball is back to 2018, 2017, 2019 levels. It seems like the drag rate is very consistent with the past couple of years. So anecdotally, it seemed like the ball was flying a little bit off the bat, but looking at the stat cast numbers, looking at the home run to fly ball rates around the league, there's actually nothing to suggest that there is. It's just been bullpen being grabbed. It's that beautiful time of the season where like, Anything that's happening, we're like dig, trying to dig in and be, could this be the cause? Could X be causing Y? Like, it, it's fun. And sometimes there are things and you notice those edges and those can be really big. And then sometimes there's a little bit of noise at the beginning of the season and it flattens out within a week. And it's like, oh, remember how we thought that? And it's like, nope, that wasn't the thing. So I, it's a really fun time for, you know, theorizing and, you know, digging in to see if there's any signal to the noise that, that we see in those first couple of days. Strand rate is, you know, a uh, left on base percentage strand rate is a number that almost always regresses to the league mean, typically about 72% over the past 10 years in baseball. So far for bullpens, it's 68%. So these bullpens just aren't but to your point, suppressing runs like they typically do. But to my point, it de I definitely think that could be a thing. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. hmm. So keep an eye on, keep an eye on that. And right now it's at 68%, the strand rate. As I said, the strikeout minus walk rate for bullpen down compared to previous years, keep an eye on those two metrics. If those stay consistent over the rest of the month, like I, I do have concerns yeah. that it may stabilize there. And then it just becomes a first five baseball betting <laughs> podcast, right? Maybe. Yeah. Or, <laughs> live yeah, or we have to bump up the, uh, the difference between first five and full game. You know, I, instead of taking like 55% of the first game total, you, you know, you actually have to make like an even more nuanced adjustment there. So it's every year we get something different with the game of baseball. <laughs> they, they don't like to give us any consistency to bet into, but that's why we're here and that's why we monitor it and, and definitely keep an eye on it for the time being. Okay. We all, we just need, we need more games. We need more data uh, yeah. to figure out what, what's going on with bullpens here in the early part of the season. Very good. Uh, find Jim and Sean in the action network app. They should have more. If not uh, find them there for uh, future slates uh, this upcoming week, we will have a podcast tomorrow. Don't forget to download and follow these guys on the free award-winning action network app. Leave a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to Payoff Pitch. For Sean Zarillo and Jim Turvey, Brendan Glasheen, back tomorrow for Best Bets. Thanks for listening. 
This is Action Network's MLB betting podcast presented by BetMGM. Enjoy your Monday. Enjoy the day games. Enjoy the entire slate. And we'll see you next time.